All right. So we've got the um, kickoff for the 2019 All Bugs Good and Bad webinar series. And this is one of the really fun ones because we get questions throughout the entire webinars and we're trying to answer them and there's, it turns into be like a big potluck of questions. And so what we've decided to do is have today be an open forum so that you can ask um, Dr. Tim Davis from the University of Georgia, uh, Janet Hurley from Texas A&M Extension, myself, um, from Clemson University, Wizzy Brown from Texas A&M Extension, and Molly Keck from Texas A&M Extension. And we are going to answer a whole lot of questions. It's going to be fun. So if you guys are ready to get started, we'll go into our first question. So one of the first things we get are are organic pesticides safer than conventional pesticides? Does anybody want to go first? I'll try to answer that one, I guess, since no one else is speaking up. Um, not always. That's something that when, when going green became kind of a new thing was a struggle, at least for me, is that people assume that because it's organic, it's safer for human health. And in reality, a lot of times organic pesticides are safer for environmental health. So you should, I always tell people, treat them like the worst pesticide you've ever touched. Still wash your hands. Don't treat your tomatoes and then pick them and eat them without cleaning them off. Don't spray your garden, even if it's organic, and then go make a sandwich for your kids. They're not always safer than conventional pesticides. And another thing is that organic um, it's just because it says organic and it's um, and it seems to be natural. Um, it doesn't mean that you're using less pesticides or that they are less toxic. Um, sometimes you have to use them. You have to use organic pesticides. Uh, maybe you have to use more or apply it more often. So it doesn't always mean that you are using less pesticides um, in that in a particular application. So anytime, this is Wizzy, anytime that you're using a pesticide, <clears throat> excuse me, all pesticides essentially are meant to kill. That is kind of the definition of pesticide. They are something that is meant to kill a pest. And so you always have to use them with care according to the labeled instructions. And that's usually where people kind of have a downfall because that label is also going to tell you exactly what equipment you need to be wearing when you apply that pesticide or you mix that pesticide. So instead of you know, going out in your t-shirt and shorts and flip-flops and treating whatever you need to treat for, you need to actually read that label and figure out if you need to have on long pants, if you need to have on a long sleeve shirt, so take the time to do that before you're doing those applications. Well, and the, other, the other aspect to me is you have to remember that organic pesticide is really referring to the source of that pesticide. And they are, they are pesticides that occur naturally in nature or have been distilled from a natural process. And so it doesn't equate it to toxic or non-toxic. Uh, it doesn't even equate to safe or unsafe. Uh, in, in essentially what they have is a list of things that are allowed. And if you use those things, you can use that label that this is organic. Uh, and even in organic production, there's a certification process. And so it turns out that it really has a lot more to do with the marketing uh, strategy and a lot less with whether you're using pesticides, using more pesticides, using less pesticides, or even using less toxic, because it, you know, as, as, as they've alluded, you know, a number of the things that are labeled as organic pesticides are extraordinarily toxic. Um, Black leaf 40, which is nicotine, is one that's, that's allowed to be used, and it's one of the most toxic substances on the planet. 
um, you know, a couple tablespoons of that will kill you. So it's, you know, again, it, it has to do with the source of where the, where the pesticide came from and how it was derived and whether it's something that occurs in nature or whether it is something that, that we have organically synthesized the molecules for that. So I think we've hit that one. Let's, what's the next one, Vicki? It is about non-native species. And how did the darn things get here? <laughs> I'll start on that one. Um, the reality is most of our non-native and invasive species, and I use both those terms, uh, they mean a little bit different thing. Uh, but what, the problem is when we put those two together, that it's, it's not native, it doesn't belong here, and it's also invasive. Uh, those are usually the ones we have the most problems with, and that's why you know, most of the people at uh, your panelists today, are, you know, we come from the fire ant world. Uh, but they get here largely by human movement. Uh, and it's sort of the planes, trains, cars sort of story. Uh, we have a number of invasive species that came from soil that was used for bows and ships around the 1900s time frame. Uh, now we're having the same problem in ports. They use water for ballast and ships. And so we're finding lots of invasive non-native uh, species in our ports. Uh, people go to another country and they find a really cool plant and they say, well, let's take that home and see if it grows here. And when you take it out of that environment, uh, it, it grows differently. Or we say, you know, hey, we'd like to grow kudzu for uh, erosion control. And nobody really thought about what else would happen with that. And so we, uh, humans are the biggest, biggest um, tool that is used for invasives to move around the planet. And that's also why as we've become more mobile and more global, uh, we see, we've seen a, an explosion of, of problems with invasive species. You guys have anything else you want to add to that? I thought it was a really good answer. <laughs> There is a, a question in the question and answer box about kudzu bugs and whether they're considered a, a good or a bad thing. And this is coming from Cynthia. And Cynthia, I wanted to ask you, <laughs> I was wondering where you are from because in Alabama, it, if my windows are rolled down in the car, we can tell you where the kudzu fields are because of the smell of the kudzu bugs. But I'll go ahead and let one of you guys answer that. I, I was actually just typing an answer. So um, with kudzu bugs, it's, they're usually considered to be more of a nuisance pest than anything when it's coming to kind of the general landscape homeowner thing because they can move indoors and fall in spring and that sort of thing. But, you know, generally when we're talking about any insect, whether it is a, um, kudzu bug or a ladybug or whatever, you have to take into account not only what the insect is doing, but where it's located and if it's causing any issues. So if you have um, a kudzu bug that is outside and it's just kind of hanging out, it's not really going to be considered a pest at that point in time because it's just doing what it needs to do outside. But when it starts moving indoors and becoming an annoying thing, then, you know, that can certainly turn into a pest situation. So, you know, the, the whole good bug, bad bug, I know we like to lump things into categories like that, but it gets a little tricky sometimes because we have, you know, some insects that are considered to be beneficials, like ladybugs, that can also move indoors like the kudzu bug um, in mass numbers in certain parts of the country. And in that case, it really turns into a pest situation, even though it's a ladybug, which everybody considers to be beneficial. So and that's, uh, that's one of, it kind of leads into that, that thing that pest, the word pest is subjective because not everything, like what was he saying is not everything is considered a pest at certain periods of time. It all depends then, on the situation. Yeah, and kudzu bugs are kind of interesting too because when they first hit the U.S., they spread very rapidly and they occurred in very high numbers. And even you know, from agronomic crops, we saw we saw real problems in cotton and soybean 
with these because they're very close related to stink bugs, which are problems. But in the last few years, the numbers have really dropped off. And so it's become, you know, in those systems where, man, we need to do some research. We need to know more, more about how to control this. And we put a lot of effort into it. And all of a sudden we started to get, finally got to a place where we knew what to do about them in, in cotton and soybeans. And now they're not occurring there in large enough numbers to worry about. So, um, again, that, you know, are they a good guy or a bad guy? Uh, a lot of it's going to depend on your, on your point of view. And certainly, you know, if they're impacting the, cut, the kudzu, then, that, then they're probably a good guy. So um, it's not always cut and dry, what's, what's good and what's bad. And it is from, the, from a human perspective. All right, what's next? All righty. The next one, so this is kind of, this, it, this is a great segue. So we've got pests in the landscape. Are there any traps homeowners can place around their yards to monitor pests? Yes. And it might be one of those things where we need to talk about traps and monitors, maybe? Yeah. Let's start with that. You know, when we talk about traps, um, the first thing we need to understand is that trapping is rarely a control measure. So you're not going to place that trap out there and catch all the snails or catch all the grubs or catch all the, the, the cockroaches or anything like that. Really all we're doing with the traps is, is monitoring to see what's there and how many are there. And, you know, we've done a lot of this. So we, we know that if I catch this many, uh, that tells me that, that that's a threshold and it's above that. I need to treat. If it's below it, I don't. It also helps us determine where the pest is. So there might be a place where there's a concentration of pest and I might go into a home and I might, I might place a bunch of sticky traps out there uh, because I, I know there's a cockroach problem, but I don't know where in this building there's a cockroach problem. So I'll put traps out there and where I'm catching lots of cockroaches on the traps, then I know I need to go back there and do a treatment. So that's the, to me, that's one of the first things that, that we have to understand about traps. Uh, and I think somebody else commented, yes, there are some things we can do for traps. So if you want to go, if you want to take it from there, talk about some of the traps that we use in the landscape or even around homes for, for monitoring pests and, and finding these populations. Are you still there, Tim? I'm still there. Okay. <laughs> I'm waiting for somebody to pick up and start talking about some of the traps we use. Sorry, I was typing in the, in the question and answer box. So it, it depends on what you're really trapping for because some of these can be rather specific as to what you're dealing with. But if you're just doing like general monitoring for white flies or aphids or something like that, you can either buy the yellow sticky card traps or you can make your own with yellow poster board and spray adhesive and put those out. Um, there are mosquito traps if you want those. There you go, Vicki's showing you some. Um, the mosquito traps are another one that is available. I don't know if I would necessarily want one of those in my yard. I would buy it for somebody else that lives a little bit down the street so they can get yeah. the mosquitoes. <laughs> um, but those are another one and you can also make your own of those. You can Google how to do that. Um, but there's, there's fly traps, there's light traps, there's, I mean, there's just tons of different things that you can use. And while um, anything that has glue is going to capture those insects and control a small portion of that population, it's not going to be the go-to to completely wipe out whatever you're having issues with. Yeah, Another that's one, one of those things where um, where traps and monitors work. You just have to remember that they're not going to get rid of everything in your yard. That's not what they're meant to do. Traps and monitors are meant to tell you where the problems are, and they'll and they'll they'll kind of help you so that you can know where to to target your strategies to manage the pest in the landscape. So the takeaway is that they're not going to take, they're not going to eliminate everything out of your yard, which is not a, a feasible um, way of thinking anyway. 
But it, they are an excellent tool in an IPM program because you are using them to help you reduce the amount of pesticides that you would use, not only because you're removing a portion of that population, but also because you are targeting instead of doing a broadcast with whatever pesticide. Yeah. Does anybody have anything else to add? I was going to say, we do recommend using monitoring and trapping a lot. Um, and, you know, I always tell the story about a hospital that had flies and through monitoring and trapping, we were able to solve their problem uh, without actually using pesticides by using traps to figure out where the problem was coming from. And then we were able to change the, the environmental conditions and, and, and keep the flies from occurring four floors up in the operating room. So uh, we do recommend them highly, but the main thing that we run into is that just remind everybody, this is not something that gets rid of the pests. It's, it tells us where they are and when they're there. All right, what's next? All right. Professional pest control operators and companies, are they worth the money? Yeah. Janet, you want to hit that one? That's kind of your, your backyard. You still there, Janet? It looks like Janet disappeared. Oh, okay. Well, I'll hit that one then. Uh, I tell people all the time that, yes, they're worth it. You know, what you're paying for is not really what's inside that, that can of stuff they're spraying. Uh, what you're paying for is what's between their ears or what they know. And really, you know, what you're getting from a pest control manager is really only as good as a technician that comes out there to your place and does the treatments. And, you know, when I hire somebody, you know, I got a PhD in entomology. Um, I hire people to come out and do it because they have the equipment uh, and they have the knowledge and they do it every day. Um, but at the same time, I'm educated. So I know what they should be doing. And so I, I, I make sure they know what they're doing. And that's why I'm hiring somebody. What are you going to be doing? Uh, I had a situation at work where uh, I'm a director of one of the botanical gardens. We actually fired uh, one of the pest control companies, a famous, you know, well-known one. If I threw the name out there, you know who it was because uh, they weren't doing IPM. And so I hired another company who told me they were going to do IPM exactly. You know, they were going to be doing all those five steps of, 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 uh, uh, identification and monitoring and decision and, and, and prediction and all those things. And then when they came in, they weren't doing that. I reminded them I, hired, I fired the last company for that. So the value comes in them doing what they're supposed to be doing and knowing what they're doing. And so you really need to do your homework when you hire one that they are going to be doing integrated pest management that if you're hiring them to control rodents, that they know how to do rodent control. And if you're hiring them to do cockroaches, they know how to do cockroach control. Or if you're hiring them for ants, they know how to do that. Because all those things are different. And I wouldn't expect any one company or any one individual to be come, up, come out there and know how to do all three of those things. Got something to add to that, Vicki or, or Molly? No, I guess the only thing I would add is, um, are they worth it? It also depends on what you're trying to control. There's definitely yes. some things that you can control on your own through just sanitation um, or exclusion, but there are certainly like termites you can't do on your own, right? Bed bugs yep. are going to be kind of hard. So it also depends on your, it depends on the specific situation, but um, if you need them, they're worth it. Exactly. And those two that she mentioned are ones that, you know, all the time I tell people, you don't have the equipment, you don't have the knowledge um, for termites. I don't, I teach it and I've taught it for years, but I don't do my own house. Um, because the other part that you're paying for on termites is, is the bond on your house that if you get termites, if your house is damaged, they're going to repair or replace that. So at that point, I don't actually care what they use as long as they're gonna fix it if it goes bad. And then bed bugs are just really, really hard uh, and is very knowledge based. And if I found that, you know, in my travels, I brought bed bugs home and I had them in the house, definitely I'm going to hire somebody who does bed bugs all the time. All right. So that's actually a really a good thing that we kind of led into some other critters um, because we've actually got a, a good number of questions um, about other critters. And um, 
and Wizzy and Molly have been answering some questions online, and um, I kind of wanted to make sure that a lot of folks saw it. Um, there's some questions about um, what about sticky boards or roach motels for household pantry pests? Um, Wizzy, do you want to talk about that? Sure. So anytime that you're dealing with a stored product pest, which there was another question about warehouse beetles that this can also answer that. Um, if you're dealing with something that is in the pantry or things like carpet beetles or anything like that where you have a source, you are going to need to track down the location of that source and get rid of it. So if you have something coming out of your pantry like Indian meal moths, you need to go through everything in your pantry to find out what is infested and either throw it away or if you don't want to do that, treat it either with heat or cold and sift out the insects if you don't want to eat them. And it's just then, extra protein. It, exactly. So you need to get rid of that source because if you are constantly trying to just kill the adults that you have emerging and you're not getting to where those eggs and larvae and pupae are, they're just going to continue to emerge as adults and it's just going to be an endless cycle. So finding that source, getting rid of it is going to be the best way to control any type of stored product. Wizzy, you mentioned using heat or cold. How cold for how long and how hot for how long? Um, well, uh, usually when it's a cold, if you want to do it a cold item, um, stick it into a deep freeze. And myself, I would leave it in there for three days to a week just to make sure everything was dead. <laughs> and then if you're doing it in the oven, you want to spread it out onto a baking sheet and you're gonna leave it in the, the lowest temperature you can, so like around, what, 200 degrees or so, and you wanna leave that for about 30 minutes or so. So this is one of those things um, where if you happen to bring an insect home or if you've got pantry pests and you wanna put this stuff in a black plastic bag out in the yard and let it bake in the sun, one of the things is, is that you're probably not going to get the heat high enough and be able to maintain it for a long enough period of time to kill the insects that are, that are your infestation. So you kind of have to, yeah, the other thing would be better. Exactly, because you get the heat a little bit higher and you get it more thoroughly through the whole thing. And when we talk about deep freeze, we're talking probably close to zero degrees. Uh, is what we recommend for freezers these days. So, you know, it's pretty cold for pretty long. Um, but the another piece of that too is that prevention is, is, is really easy to do. You know, as you purchase these products, uh, you know, putting, putting cereal products or flour products or anything like that, putting that in a plastic container, putting it in the freezer or keeping it in the freezer or even the refrigerator from the very start is going to keep you from having those problems and it's easier to, to deal with it that way than it is to deal with it once it once it gets um gets has taken hold and and uh, you have an actual infestation so one of the issues with the with the 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 infestations is that we've got somebody saying that they understand you got to find the source and they know where the source is but the source is come, they live in a, in, a, in a complex. And so it's coming from another unit. Yeah, mm -hmm. neighbors are like that, aren't they? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's one of those you're gonna have to, well, either buck up and go knock on a door or you're gonna probably need to contact the management company and talk to them about it. Exactly. Because if the source is coming from a place you can't treat, there's nothing really much you can do about it. It just will, it will constantly and continually always be a problem until you get rid of the source. So we've also got some questions um, about reading labels and why people don't read the pesticide labels <laughs> um, and the mentality of more is better when it's, it's absolutely not 
but why don't people read the labels and how do we get them to read them? That's an uphill battle. <laughs> yep. I mean, it, you know, reality is, you know, every, everybody on this panel, we all work for extension. We all work for land grants. We all work with pesticides and pesticide education. I know Vicki and I have done uh, all day trainings on this. I know Janet Hurley has, I know Wizzy has. Uh, I've got a, I got a hour long talk on just one label that, that we use pretty regularly. And, you know, people call us all the time about this product or that product. And a lot of times what I'm doing is I'm pulling, I'm pulling a label up on, uh, off the internet and reading it to them. Uh, and, they, and they think you're smart because you just, you know, Vicki found a website called let me Google that for you. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 uh, but the reality is, you know, people get their minds wrapped around something and changing people's minds is difficult. And that's why, that's why we have job stability. And I, I wish they would all, you know, read the label and follow the label and, and apply these correctly. Because a lot of the problems that we run into with losing pesticides that are, that are valuable pesticides uh, stem from misuse. Uh, and a lot of times it's even people who know better, you know, well, I'm the only one doing it. Well, you're not the only one doing it. And it's okay for me to do this in my pasture. Uh, well, no, it's not. Um, or, or it works, you know, well, that's not really even the point either. The, the point is that if you do this correctly, it's going to work. Um, and so, yeah, it's a battle that we fight every day as part of our job. I, I think some of us, that's, that's part of why we do this is to help the public understand that pesticides are necessary. We can't produce enough food for everybody to eat without pesticides. And 40% of our food uh, supply is lost every year to store grain products or, or store grain pests. You know, we need pesticides to, do, to, to, to have enough food. But that abusiveness of it is going to, going to make it so that we can't. Uh, and, and restricts us and makes it harder. And so I, I think a lot of us are very passionate about trying to, trying to make it that way. But, you know, people are stubborn. And I'm trying to avoid saying people are stupid, but th they're at least stubborn. Yeah, this is one of those things where we've got to try to get folks to come to our programming so that they hear us tell them that by state and federal law, you are required to read the entire label and abide by everything on that label. No matter with what your personal beliefs are or what, you know, you think you know better, you have got to do what that label says. And Every one of those labels says it's a violation of federal law to use this product in a manner inconsistent with its labeling. So this is one of those things where we've just got to change the way that people think. Um, we have to make them more diligent in using pesticides because most people, they may or may not read, they read the brand name, they may or may not read what the active ingredients are, um, and then they read halfway how to mix it and how to apply it they don't read all of the stuff in between. So we have to, we have to get them to read the actual whole thing. Yeah. Um, I had a phone they're call. They're looking for that number of how many glugs do I put in the, in the, in the, in the sprayer, you know, glug, glug, glug. <laughs> yeah, I had, um, I had somebody call me and ask me advice. And uh, I told him, um, I said, read the label. And he was like a little kid. He said, the whole label. And I said, yes. And he said, but it's eight pages. And I was sitting there thinking, how old are you? <laughs> yes, you have to read the whole thing. Whole thing. Um, so that kind of leads us into, um, there's a question about why isn't IPM required for pest control companies to use that strategy? Well, th this is busy. Um, I have a background in structural pest control. And so it's not a required thing because they can't, I mean, that's not something that you can necessarily regulate that they're coming out and inspecting. 
a lot of companies are going to an IPM. Uh, it used to be that when people came out to do pest control at your home, they came in with the B&G sprayer and they sprayed around the baseboards in every room of your house and then they gave you the invoice and they left. But now they're coming in with flashlights and they're looking for where those pests are. They're putting out sticky traps as monitors to figure out where things are moving in and out. They're looking for what we call conducive conditions to actually figure out what might be leading to pest problems because pests are essentially looking for food, shelter, and water. And that's a lot of times why they are moving inside at certain times of the year. And so while they may be using IPM, um, they can't really necessarily require it, but it is a better, um, Usually it's a better selling tool, especially in some markets, because a lot of people don't want people to just come in and spray pesticides all over the place. But that being said, there are certain programs that pest control companies may be involved in where they're green certified or something like that, and it has uh, things attached to that or requirements attached to it. And so if they are part of one of those programs, it may be that they are required to use IPM and they have to document what they do on those accounts and that is checked on. So that's certainly something to ask when you are looking for a pest control company. Ask them if they know what IPM is, if that is a strategy that they use. Um, ask for references and check up on those references to see what they're company is actually like and what you can expect from service. That's a really good answer because it is hard to regulate it. Um, but if you are educated as a consumer, you can require that of, of the people who come into your home to or your business to, to do those treatments. And as I said, you know, I, fire, I fired a company just for just what Molly was saying. They were coming in doing with a B&G sprayer, which is, a, you know, an old fashioned kind of sprayer treating baseboards and of course they didn't know who I was or anything like that and so when I started talking to them about it recognized very quickly they didn't know what IPM was and the second company came in and they did the same thing and I talked to the owner I basically told him I was going to fire him but the owner called me and you know he's like well what do you think IPM is and I began quoting to him what from, from the handbook pest control malice you know what IPM was and, and all of a sudden it dawned on him that this guy really wants IPM and that's what I got now and ever since then they've been out there doing sticky traps uh, monitoring using the flashlights looking for the problems and treating that way um, largely because I use the dollars that I have to to spend on pest control to vote for this type of pest control and if you're not going to give that to me, I'll go find somebody else. And, and so I, I'm getting much better pest control. And by the way, he's probably saving money because we know that research going back into the 80s, uh, Phil Kaler did some, some out of University of Florida, did some work back in the late 80s that showed that, that IPM is actually not only reduces pesticides, but it is, it's, it's lower cost for the pest control company. So their margin is a lot larger and they make more money off of it. So um, we're gonna switch gears. Um, Wizzy had answered a question about um, uh, grubs and snails. Um, do you want to, uh, to hit that again? Did I answer it or did Molly? Molly, did you answer the snail question? I answered a slug and snail question. Oh, yes. sorry. It was Molly. So, so Molly, she wants to know how to prevent snails and slugs in the landscape um, and then some of the control measures. Um, so snails and slugs thrive in wet, moist environments. So if you can just one easy cultural control thing is cut down on moisture, um, reduce mulch maybe, or turn the mulch over so that it dries out, cut back on watering, allow the soil to dry out. And it's not that it will necessarily kill every single one, but they don't thrive because they don't enjoy that kind of environment. Um, there's snail and slug baits that you can use. They're just like little pellets, I think, and whatever eats it might die from it. But really, if you just reduce the, the water, then they kind of go away on their own. 
Um, another thing is that a lot of time plants at the bot at the base of the plant, if it if the foliage is too intense, they'll get all crammed up underneath there and start feeding on the plant. So if, if it is a plant where you can kind of trim up so that there's not uh, leaves touching the soil, that helps. And then I think there's a question about how to prevent grubs. I don't really know that you can prevent grubs other than saying that uh, in general, a well-established landscape doesn't encourage pest problems, or at least it tolerates pest problems better. So just making sure that you fertilize and water well and you don't have a stressed out lawn might help reduce grub issues. Um, I don't know one of those things. Healthy landscapes, um, like Molly's saying, tend to, tend to manage whenever there's a pest infestation a little bit better. Um, so that you're not, what ends up happening is if you have stressed out landscaping, they're going to attract the bad stuff. And then when she's talking about making sure that you're fertilizing and watering like you're supposed to, don't just throw fertilizer out there. Don't just throw lime out there willy nilly. You need to be doing a soil test to check your nutrient levels and your pH levels to make sure that you actually need some of those nutrients if they're missing so that you're applying them at the proper rate. You're not, you're not having too much in there. Um, maybe having a, a, an excess of calcium or phosphorus. You definitely don't want excess of phosphorus out in the lawns because those can wash out into the waterways and then you end up getting algae blooms and then you get fish kills and you don't want to get into that stuff. So um, in order to help maintain that healthy landscape so that it, it can deal with infestations better, contact your local extension service about getting soil tests done, soil tests done, done so that you can get proper recommendations to manage your landscape. So she said, I think this person, she said that the snail and grub problems are in her vegetable garden. Um, for snails, then, you would probably want to hand pick. There's also things like copper barriers that you can use. Um, if you're going with the snail and slug bait and you have pets, make sure that you get the kind that is safe for pets to use because there is snail and slug bait that can be very dangerous and could kill um, companion animals. So make sure that you're using the right type there. And then as far as the grubs in the veggie garden, Usually the, yes, the one with iron, that is correct. Um, you, I think you want the, the met aldehyde snail and slug bait for uh, pet safety. Um, and then the grubs that you typically find in vegetable gardens, those are usually going to be different than the ones that you are collecting or getting and causing problems in turf. So those are going to generally not be too much of a problem to the actual vegetable plants themselves. And then somebody else said, how about using crushed eggshells and jars with beer? Um, I don't know how well the crushed eggshells work. I know that uh, some people will use like diatomaceous earth in there. And then um, as far as beer, you can certainly put out beer traps. A lot of people will do that, but then I also have a lot of people that say that's a good waste of beer and they don't want to put out beer traps. Something if you else beer that you traps, can do is just a board let me add or this. cardboard. Go ahead, Vicki. If you want to use beer traps, I would advise that you cover them somehow to keep the dogs out of them. <laughs> I had a Yorkie that decided that he was going to help himself to the, to the slug beer trap. Love it. <laughs> you can also use just like a, a piece of cardboard that you put into a tent, put that out in the evening, and then the snails will kind of conglomerate and gather underneath it, and then you can chunk it in the garbage in the morning. And the spelling, it's metaldehyde. Uh, Miss Arnold, it's like MET and then aldehyde, so that should take care of that. The other thing I will add about grubs is a lot of those grub species, there's a threshold for those. Most of the thresholds, the, the lowest thresholds are like six grubs per square foot. The, the, some of the other grubs, it's 12 grubs per square foot. So if you're taking a 12 inch by 12 inch um, 
bit of soil and you sift that out, you probably don't need to do treatments until you have between six and 12 grubs in that. And reality is I, I don't think I've seen that, but a few times um, in my career and over the last 25 years. And I, the, the two, I think the two times that I can remember it, it was on golf courses. Uh, and I actually discovered it on the golf courses because I was, the birds were going after the, the grubs and, and causing problems with the, the quality of turf. Uh, but as soon as they ate all the grubs, the birds went away and the turf grew back. So the, you know, the numbers that you have to have for grubs to truly be a problem is really pretty high. Also, if, if they're in your veggie garden, I wonder if, so there's, you know, white grubs that feed on turf and then any beetle larvae is considered a grub, right? So you might actually have what I consider beneficial grubs. If they're real big, they're probably composters. They might even be predators. So they might not actually be doing anything bad. They might be good. And you can take those. Um, they, they're not particularly easy to identify for a non-entomologist, but most entomologists should be able to identify those at least down to genus. Um, and they actually, there's, there's hair patterns on the last segment on their abdomen uh, that you look at. And, you know, we have maps of, of what those should look like. And if they can't do that at the local county extension office, uh, we have the ability to either send pictures to somebody who can do it, or we can actually send the, the grub to an entomologist who can, who can identify it. Uh, and that will tell you, you know, that, that threshold. Uh, it'll tell you if it's actually a, a, really a bad guy or a good guy uh, or not. And, and so, you know, it comes back to that IPM of the first step is identification. Um, and they are a little bit harder to identify, you know, for you have to have some magnification and you have to have the, the, the literature that, helps you understand what what the pattern should look like for the various groups that are out there all right janet are you there yes i'm finally back <laughs> good deal um so there was a question earlier about um bed bugs and everybody can chime in on the bed bug thing um they were they were asking about um, some of the the pesticides used on bed bugs if they're if they work. Um, so I, I I've referenced that we had a um, a bed bug webinar previously and that I would send them the um, the uh, link to it. But um, could maybe somebody talk a little bit about um, some of the management of bed bugs? You want to hit that one, Janet? No, I'm going to defer to Lizzie. I could probably <laughs> answer. <laughs> so um, when we're talking about bed bugs, um, if you, like, like Tim said earlier, um, bed bugs generally aren't a kind of do-it-yourself thing. I know a lot of people do want to try to control them yourselves. Um, if you have an infestation that is just starting off that has a very small population that is in only one room of your house, then that might be a feasible thing. But if they have been there a while or they have spread to various areas of the house, then that's really when you're, you're going to have to call in a professional. And depending upon um, what company you go with, this is one of those where you need to you know, get various bids and know what you're actually dealing with with bed bugs. Um, you need to figure out what product they're using and what strategy. Some of them have heat treatments that they'll do where they don't actually use pesticides. They're going to heat the home and hold that temperature at um, usually, you know, four to six hours and they're making sure that that temperature is penetrating all those areas to kill the bed bugs. Um, there are also situations where they'll do cryo treatments, which is a cold treatment. There are steam treatments that could be done. Uh, as far as chemicals, um, there are pyrethroid products, but we do have bed bug strains in the United States that are resistant to those particular types of pesticides. And until they try to use those pesticides on the population of bed bugs, they generally don't know unless it's been genetically tested. 
Um, there's neonicotinoids, the, like an imidacloprid product that you could use. Some companies will use uh, diatomaceous earth, which is going to abrade the exoskeleton and cause uh, drying out or water loss for the bed bugs. There are um, like chlorfenapyr, which is a, a pyrrole product. Those are labeled for bed bugs inside and those can often be used. They're a non-repellent. And then um, there's also uh, the biological, I think the latest biological is the, the azadiractin or the neem. And I think that there are people that are also working on some other biological products, but they're not quite on the market. So there are a variety of things that can be utilized, but you really need to um, understand what you're getting from each company because it may be that for a bed bug treatment, you don't want to necessarily go with the bargain basement price. It may be that you want to pay a little bit more <laughs> for that. And we here at Texas and in AgriLife Extension, we do have a publication. If anyone is interested, you could search it. It is how to choose a bed bug control provider. And it goes through the different types of treatments and questions that you can ask those companies that are coming out for inspection. I think another important thing, maybe you can address this too, is uh, the best thing about bed bugs is, is, is to not bring them home with you. And so, yes, um, you but know, you, when, we, you when we go places, see that unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's kind of funny because you know, when, when entomologists go places, you know, we all check our rooms. So maybe you could talk about how do you check a, you know, check a, check a hotel room or something before you actually, you know, bring them home. Sure. So, and this isn't just when you travel. Um, this is, I, my husband does bed bug work and so he is paranoid. And so I, I know exactly <laughs> where to look for things. So, you know, when you go to a hotel room, you want to keep your luggage by the door or stick it into the bathtub so you can, you know, see that there aren't any bed bugs in the bathtub. And I always carry a pen light flashlight with me. You're going to strip the bedding off of the bed. You're going to inspect the mattress seams. You're going to take the mattress off the bed. You're going to inspect the box springs. That includes the bottom because usually the bed bug populations start on the underside of the box springs. Um, if you can remove the headboard from the bed, that sometimes is possible, sometimes not. And look behind that, look in the nightstand areas and see if all of those areas are clear. And you're looking for the insects, you're looking for skins that they may have left behind when they have molted. You're looking for blood stains, which sometimes, and fecal spotting, so it's, you know, brownish to blackish, depending on how old it is and how much has built up. Um, and if they have bed bug protectors on the mattress and box springs, that doesn't mean that they have bed bugs. That could mean that they're just being proactive and they're putting that on there so it makes it easier to inspect later on. Um, but you also have to be careful in other areas as well, not just when you go to a hotel. Uh, bed bugs have been found in movie theaters. So movie theater seats, you have to look there. Um, we've had them in library books. So if you're checking out books from the library, you can have them because where do you, you know, if you read in bed, you put that book on the book stand. If you have bed bugs, there you go. Um, you know, it, it can be anywhere. People have brought them home from work because if they're in a cubicle situation and somebody has an infestation at their house, then they're in the cubicle next door, boom, they can move right over. So, you know, sometimes you can inspect and try to prevent those things, but sometimes, you know, you just unfortunately hit the unlucky lottery and you bring something home with you. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> So I think one last question, um, what is the best way to get rid of moles? Oh, I got a, I got a mountain cur dog and she can <laughs> about four or five a week in my yard. Unfortunately, I think she does more damage than the moles do. 
So wow. I, I can talk about this. My neighbor actually had a mole last year, so I talked to our wildlife person. So a lot of this um, with moles is going to be based upon soil moisture levels. So if they, they tend to like moisture soils. Um, so if you allow it to dry out, then it makes it more difficult for them to tunnel through and they will typically move to a new location. It also uh, reduces the food source because they're going to be feeding on earthworms. And so again, that moisture level will play in. The thing that my, the wildlife guy here at the office told me when we were dealing with the active mole infestation was to flood them out. And so they essentially just stuck a hose down in the hole and let it run. And if you're going to do that, you need to dig down to the main tunnels, not just those, those ones that are going across the yard where they push up. That's not really a main tunnel. You have to go back up and kind of dig down to get to that main, that main tunnel, which is probably a little deeper than, than, you're, than you're noticing without getting a shovel out and doing that. The, the nice thing is that they're, while they're unsightly, they probably are not doing truly significant damage to your turf grass. Um, if anything, they might be de-aerating it. Uh, I'll also add that, you know, so there's things out there like if you can control the grubs, uh, the moles will go away, and that's not true. Uh, their primary diet is earthworms. So, you know, that's what they're there looking for. Uh, and that goes back to what Molly was saying about the the um, the uh, moisture levels. Uh, juicy fruit doesn't work. Uh, it, it's not. It does, it does, it, it's a waste of gum. So um, Irish Spring like, soap. Yeah, there's almost as many home remedies for that as there are for fire ants, and and, and really home remedies are just something to stay away from. Yep. So. All right. Um, does anybody have any last uh, things to add? Well, I think the one thing, you know, and we run into this all the time, and I think everybody would agree that, you know, pest management is, is really a knowledge-based type of thing. And so if you are having a pest, you know, start with that knowledge, start with identification, start with really understanding that pest before you just start going out and doing things. And that's really why we do these, these webinars uh, and pick the, the topics that we pick is to really help people increase their knowledge and, and help them make those, those, those decisions correctly. Uh, and, and in doing that, you're going to use fewer pesticides. You're going to be happy with your pest control uh, that you receive. Um, and, of course, I'm a little bit biased, I guess. We all work for extension. So, you know, get out there and use that tool. You've got – You've got extension agents in most counties throughout the country um, that can either help you with it or have access to universities who can and specialists who can help you uh, understand what needs to be done for whatever pest it is you're trying to control. Done preaching. All righty. So um, Danny is putting up some poll questions. If you would. Um, answer those poll questions for us and while you're doing that um, I'm going to let you guys know that um, every month we've got a webinar and next month um, we are going to have some updates on Emerald Ash Borer um, by Lynn Womack from the Georgia Forestry Commission. So we'll meet back here on March 1st at 2 p.m. and um, I don't know if Danny can talk or not. She may have some stuff. I can talk now, and I apologize about those three minutes of silence. My my computer completely went black. But that's thank y'all for doing this. Um, actually, I, I get emails while y'all are getting chat boxes. So I've had a couple of people email to ask if this was going to be recorded. Yes, it is. It will be um, put back on the website um, Monday. So check back on the website Monday and you'll be able to watch that recording. And all of our webinars are recorded. Um, and so you can find archives for past webinars. Um, if you Google um, uh, uh, all bugs, good and bad webinars, 
and you'll find pages where you can go back and find the schedule and then you can see links to the archived recordings. But anyway, thanks you guys for being here today and asking all these questions. Um, and you guys, I guess we'll see y'all in, in March. Y'all have a good month. Thank you. We'll see y'all later.